I was lucky enough to see Interstellar in IMAX when it was re-released a couple of years ago and ever since I've been craving that same adrenaline rush that I got during the docking scene. Since then, nothing has come close in the theatre. Maybe Top Gun Maverick, but I can't say that I've ever felt as absorbed into a scene since. So in today's video, I'm going to be covering how Hoyt van Hoytemer achieved that effect on the audience through his use of lighting, the look he and Nolan created, as well as the equipment he used to transport us. So as we all know, Nolan has a thing for IMAX, which means that this film was partially shot in IMAX, and to me, it's the film from him that has benefited the most from it. The large format allows us to be transported into space more than using a wide angle or establishing shot ever could. Now, as for the cameras, Hoytemer went with a Beaumont VistaVision. Yes, some of this film was shot in VistaVision, as well as an IMAX MSM 9802 and Panavision Panaflex Millennium XL2. Now, choosing to shoot in VistaVision is a peculiar choice, as it's a really odd format, and it's used very rarely. In fact, according to Wikipedia, which may not be that reliable, Interstellar was the last film to actually use VistaVision for anything. Now, in the most basic terms, instead of shooting vertically, VistaVision shoots horizontally, which coincidentally, so does IMAX. It basically just allows for a higher resolution image, but this really needs a whole video to itself. When it comes to the lenses though, he opted for Hasselblad, My Mars, Leica's and Panavision's glass, going with their C, D, E and ultra speed golden lenses. Now to explain the plethora of lenses at the beginning, this is because you can only shoot with certain lenses on IMAX and VistaVision cameras, as they have to cover the entire frame, and Hasselblad, Maimar and Leica made the highest quality glass for them at the time. Now, for both the 35 and 65mm scenes, he used Kodak's Vision 350D, 250D and 500T, which, if I've learnt anything from doing these videos for the past 18 months, is a very normal lineup, both for Nolan and in general. It covers every situation you could have, and with Kodak, you know exactly what you are getting. I mean, if we look at Inception, The Dark Knight and Tenet, we can see them using a similar, if not the same selection, so Nolan definitely likes what he knows. Now, as I've never been to space, and there's a good chance you haven't either, it's impossible to know what the light would actually look like in a space station, especially to the naked eye. However, as we have the ISS and now 4K footage of what space actually looks like, we can make a pretty safe assumption. But realism wouldn't have been the number one priority here. Hoytema actually needed to make it look good, and he did, namely through shadows and realistic lighting, well, as realistic as you can get in space. I'm going to go back to my favourite term, heightened realism. The use of artificial lights to enhance what the natural light is, or what the natural light would look like. Basically, say you walk into a room and you already love the light. It's glowing, in the perfect place, but in five minutes it's going to be gone. With heightened realism, you'd artificially create that light, but then add a kicker or something that just amplifies it. Now in Interstellar, especially on the planets, the lighting tends to be rather high key, yet Hoytema has managed to keep depth in the image, either through a strong kicker or collaborations with the production department, but they've also managed to keep it interesting outside of the ship, because in the ship he could have just switched a couple of lamps on and it would have looked great, because it's a spaceship. But he didn't do that, he instead went the route of what seems to me as a lot of practical light, which he again would have built with the production designers. But something I noticed was his use of shadows, and this carries on from the first few scenes all the way to the end, and we see it used in a number of ways. Maybe they are falling off faces, rooms falling into shadow, or even rolling across faces. It's not only a way to break up the image, but it also makes it feel a bit more real. Now, I'm going to direct everyone to what I like to call the FaceTime scene, as there's a constant wave of shadow that juxtaposes with the harsh light that we see, and it just makes the whole scene feel a bit more genuine. We know that Cooper is fine, but Murph and Tom? They just think he's gone. Now, I could go deeper and suggest that Cooper is almost having mood swings with waves of happiness and darkness, knowing that he's missed out on years, but also knowing that they're okay, but that's too pretentious for me and these videos. To move on to a more interesting part, let's look at how Hoytema actually lit some of these scenes. Now, if we look at some of these behind the scenes photos and footage, we can see that he likes reflection. So this could be for a few reasons. 
Firstly, he'll want to soften the light, and it's a great way to do it, as this way you also save on space as you don't have anything in front or behind the diffusion, whichever way you want to look at it. Now, as far as I can tell, he also utilised natural light, and with huge sheets of diffusion. The fabric though, I don't know, anyway, they were very big. When natural light wasn't available though, he of course went with 18Ks. So as I mentioned earlier, there is a lot of practical light where Hoytemer would have worked with the production designers to build light into the sets, not only making it easier to shoot as you don't have to worry about getting a light in, but it also just makes it feel a lot more authentic. So when it comes to the look, I think we need to start with the fact that Hoytemer kept it shallow, which as films are usually shot in quite deep focus, is rather interesting. I mean, just by looking through some stills from Nolan's other films, we can see that he likes it rather shallow, so it isn't specific to Interstellar. However, we can interpret this a number of ways. Firstly, it could be to create emphasis on a certain character, for example, Cooper, or maybe he wants to isolate people from the background. There are really countless ways you could use it, all from the ones I've mentioned to just it looks nice. However, here I think it had deeper meaning, but I also think it was meant to be interpreted by the audience. Something I can analyse with a lot more confidence, however, is camera angles, because in general there are certain rules, even though you don't necessarily have to abide by them. So let's start off with the most obvious fact that most of this film is shot at eye level. Now to me, I'd say this is because we know no more than Cooper. Well, when it comes to him in space, as we are occasionally transported back to Earth. Now, that isn't to say that we don't move up and down, because there are slight alterations on the y-axis, for example, when there is less or more power in a character. The most prominent example, for me at least, is with Man, Matt Damon's character, as there is an extremely subtle low angle on him, with all of the others being in a rather high angle. Now, it wouldn't be one of my cinematography analysis without looking at central framing, and in Interstellar, it's really prominent. Now I'd say most of the time it's used to create emphasis, or at least that's what I got out of it, but that other 10% is a mix of immersion and power. I mean, it's a tool that can be used for pretty much any scenario and relies a lot on everything else going on, but it just adds that little bit more. Which leads us quite nicely into how they were guiding the eye visually, which is definitely a collaboration between departments because a lot of the time anyway, it's done not only through lighting but also sets, most notably in the ship. Now this isn't to say that the lighting isn't a prominent aspect of guiding the eye, as it is, if we go back to the years of messages scene for example, where yes, he is pretty central, but the light is guiding us. To quickly touch on the colour aspect though, it feels like every Nolan film, authentic. Scene to scene, the colour changes appropriately, they're deep, crisp, I don't really know the best way to describe them apart from the fact that I wouldn't want it any other way. So, in conclusion, Hoytemer used formats that could convey the scale of space that he and Nolan were after. The way in which he used light created a sense of heightened realism, and his composition not only had meaning, but it allowed us to look deeper into the story in ways words can't. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video, not just if you did, if you have a recommendation for an analysis, leave it down below. Thanks so much for watching, and maybe I'll see you next time. Bye!